Our first reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 29, beginning at verse 30. And this may be found in your church Bibles on page 714. <laughs> The Lord said, these people come near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. Therefore, once more, I will stand with these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us? Who will know? You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me. Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? In a very short time, will not Lebanon be turned into a fertile field, and the fertile field seem like a forest? In that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Once more, the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. And our second reading this morning is uh, comes from Revelation 3, starting at verse 1. And it's in your church Bible on page uh, 1,235. One, two, three, five. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you who have a people in Sardis, you, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes, they will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. Is. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Heavenly Father, we pray that that blessing might be ours today. In Jesus our Lord. Amen. How important to you is your reputation? I've seen how it can be devastating when people lose their reputation. People spread gossip about them or they 
fail to live up to their own reputation and get exposed. And I know people who put a huge amount of effort into restoring a damaged reputation and trying to clear their name. The courts try to put a financial value on it for compensation. How much is your reputation worth to you? Today, we're challenged to think not so much what the world thinks of us as what Jesus thinks. We've been over the last few weeks looking at a series of letters the risen Lord sent from heaven by giving a vision to his servant John to seven churches in the first century. Seven churches represent the whole church. He speaks to us through these letters. We thought a few weeks ago about how, in a way, they read a bit like school reports, usually saying something positive and something that could be improved, maybe in a praise sandwich. But today's letter is not so balanced. Jesus comes in, all guns blazing. This is the Jesus who knows and loves the church. The vision in chapter one had him walking among the lampstands, tending the lamps. The lampstands represent churches whom he knows and loves. This is Jesus, the Lord, the Almighty, who's seen in his power and dazzling glory. He holds the stars in his hand. That vision had told us, and this letter reminds us the stars represent the angels of the churches. I'm not sure exactly what that means, whether they're human leaders or messengers or heavenly representatives. But it means, I am sure, Jesus is in authority over the church. It's his and over the churches. It is his opinion that counts. The seven spirit of God in verse 1, referring back to chapter 1, verse 4, is another expression that I'm not certain about. I'm not certain about how it is, but I am quite sure that it's, it's a reference to God's complete divine power. It may be, I, we remember that the number 7 represents completeness, that this, this is referring to the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who is one person, but sevenfold, complete in his total activity. And you may have noticed the footnotes in the Bible um, saying that it could be understood to be the sevenfold spirit. As we say in the Nicene Creed, which is often said at communion services, he, the Holy Spirit, proceeds from the Father and the Son. Both the members of the Trinity, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are equal. The Son obeys the Father. And Jesus sends his Spirit to his church from the Father. We could discuss this more over coffee and perhaps in home groups, but, but the big point, I think, is that it is Jesus' opinion that counts. And his opinion, his assessment of the church is devastatingly brief. In one short clause at the end of verse one, he gives the whole picture from his point of view. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Their reputation is of being alive. It's the only positive thing at the beginning, if it is a positive thing. Um, and he doesn't explain why they have this reputation of being alive or, or what it means. But let's pause on that for a, a moment. What, what would it mean? Can we imagine for a church to have a reputation for being alive? Why would they and how would they have gained that reputation? Well, maybe, maybe they had strong numbers growing numbers at the church. They probably had healthy finances. 
They didn't have a, a parish share to pay, which is something that undoubtedly affects a church's reputation in the diocese today. But maybe they were giving generously to other churches in need and supporting missions. Jesus knows their deeds. They probably didn't have a broken heating system, but if they had, they would have been noticed for getting it repaired quickly with a snazzy new environmentally healthy <laughs> system. Maybe they had a lot going on in the church. Jesus knows their deeds. Maybe they had their equivalent of the bridge and they built bridges into the community so that everyone thought well of them. Anyone coming to their meetings would be impressed with the quality of the music and would and the coffee and would would find the sermons interesting which presumably would be saying things that people liked. A church with a reputation probably speaks up on the issues where its message is approved of and it can go with the flow of contemporary society. For us today, that might be issues like the environment, where the message of the Bible and caring for God's good creation is very acceptable to the mood around us and people's awareness of the need to care for the environment or issues like mental health or being anti-slavery. We don't have a problem with getting on those bandwagons and a church with a reputation might keep quiet on issues where it would be swimming against the tide of popular opinion. So saying very little about marriage and sexual morality or about the sanctity of life, particularly at its beginning and end. I imagine in, in all these areas, the church in Starnes was well regarded. It had a reputation for being alive. And yet, Jesus' diagnosis is that it is dead as a tin of sardines. There's a problem on the inside. At the top of the Vicarage Drive, I don't know if you ever noticed driving down Barthamson Lane, there's a lovely big tree with lots of pink blossom on it at the moment. So there's a, a purple plum. Uh, it doesn't produce any fruit, it's an ornamental thing. Um, but it's been growing vigorously, and um, it's quite a big tree, we've realised, as um, the Sainsbury band knocks into it and things like that and needed to uh, cut it back. It's a problem being too lively and being in a conservation area I had to um, get the special permission to prove it and we have a friend who's a tree surgeon who came to stay for the weekend and uh, he and I went, went up to uh, cut this tree back and as we cut branches off we realised that they were dead on the inside. It was seriously infected with a fungal infection and lots of the tree was dead. Even though it looked alive and seemed to be growing, it was really weak. And even after removing lots of these uh, branches in the, the last big storm that we had, a great big branch came down from it because it was just rotten inside. A church can be like that. There's a real danger of a church having a reputation and yet fulfilling the words of Isaiah that we heard from Isaiah 29, 13. These people come near to me with their mouth, God says, and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I've been um, enjoying this book, which I bought secondhand on eBay. Uh, no, on Amazon, sorry, it doesn't matter. A uh, few weeks ago for this sermon series by John Stott, What Christ Thinks of the Church. And it's an exposition of Revelation 1 to 3. Um, and I'd come across this back in the 1990s. Um, and his words are very pertinent on this issue. He says, hypocrisy 
can permeate the life of the church, especially its worship. We can sing the hymns led by choir and band or orchestra. We can recite the creed, say the confession and join in the prayers while our mind wanders and our heart is far from God. It makes no difference whether the service is liturgical or non-liturgical, whether it's marked by Catholic ritual or Protestant or austerity, the same unreality can be present. Pastors or priests or ministers are particularly vulnerable. We can lead a service with little awareness of the greatness of the God we're professing to worship. And we can preach rather to display our learning or eloquence than to exalt Christ and minister to the people. But all Christian activity, if it's not an expression of love for God or others, is a hollow mockery and an empty pantomime. The last two weeks, we've been looking at letters where Jesus challenged the churches over an obvious failure. They were tolerating false teaching and sexual immorality. Today's challenge is over something that may be harder to spot. The sin of pride can easily hide behind a good reputation. The more skill you and I become at promoting a Christian reputation for ourselves, the more we might appear humble whilst being full of our staff, our deadly self. Jesus' diagnosis for this church is of deadness. And yet he has a remedy for them. Wake up. And if you look at verses two and three, there are five things he tells them to do. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. So things that there is something that's not dead. Remember what you have received and heard. Reminds me of our theme verse for this year. Does it uh, strike a chord? For you, Colossians 2, verse 6, just if you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and in the faith as you were taught, and by the thankfulness. So remember what you received and heard, and for hold it fast, which means obey and keep the teaching, and fifth, repent. So is that church in Sardis actually dead or not quite dead? I mean, there's no point telling a dead person to wake up, is there? Well, I'm reminded of several places where being dead and being asleep are not so different from each other for Jesus. Do you remember the um, that man called Jairus, the single really, who had a daughter who died. And when Jesus went to visit, and the, the dead young girl was there in the house, he made the mourners laugh by saying, she's not dead, she's only asleep. And do you remember a few weeks ago, we read about Lazarus, Jesus' friend. Uh, Jesus and his disciples heard news that Lazarus was ill and Jesus confused his disciples by saying, uh, Lazarus has fallen asleep and I'm going to wake him up. Why would Jesus go and wake him if he needed sleep? And then 1 Thessalonians 4, words that we often hear in a, in a funeral service, Paul encourages Christians with good news about those who've fallen asleep in Christ, that is, who died. Jesus will wake them up at the resurrection. And that's why we can remember Barbara with hope and particularly trust that she is resting in Christ. And though we're today 
burying her cremated remains in the ground. We know that Jesus will raise up and give renewed bodies to all who trusted in him. He speaks, and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. There's blessing for those, chapter 1, verse 3, who hear Jesus' words and take them to heart. And even for this church in Sardis, that he said, you're dead, he is still calling them to life. And he calls us, whatever stage we're at, in our journey, in our relationship with God, whether there's a living faith or whether there's deadness on the inside, it's not too late to repent, strengthen what remains, remember what we've heard of the good news of Jesus, and keep it, obey him. And Jesus gives a big encouragement at the end. First of all, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. Soiled clothes. In Old Testament Israel, there was a remnant of faithful people when the nation as a whole rejected the Lord and turned to false gods. Even in dead Sardis, there are some living sardines ready to swim against the flow. In verse 4, people who have not soiled their clothes, dirty clothes, I think, are symbolic of contamination by the world. And this church has got worldly in its thinking, it's blended in as the Christians have become complacent and as a church it, it's gained so much of a reputation in society. Some in that church are dressed in white and worthy, not because they've done so well and they've earned this worthy status by right, but because they're dressed in Christ's righteousness with his status of worthiness, it's justification by faith. Nominal Christianity, being a Christian in name only and not in heart, is something that infected the church in Sardis and can infect a local church and a denomination like the Church of England. And heart Christians might find ourselves surrounded by nominal Christians. The remnant in Sardis is called to strengthen what remains and is about to die. And I'd like to quote again from John Stott. Uh, back in 1990, or the um, sermons that this was based on that he preached even before that, commenting on this passage, says, here then is the duty of the church within the church. God has often worked through minorities. It is his gracious plan to call out from the world and even from the masses of nominal believers, a faithful and committed remnant to be his instrument, an alive and awake minority can recall the majority from death. A robust remnant can strengthen what remains and is about to die. And that can be the case where you have a few praying people trusting God within a church that has died spiritually. And it can be a few faithful congregations within a denomination. That was turned from the Lord and blended with 
society. The great encouragement from Jesus that some will overcome, some will be victorious. But they're dressed in white, his robes of righteousness. And he has a book of life with names in it. Look at verse five. I will never blot out the name of that person, person who trusts Jesus and keeps trusting him from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Do we care about our reputation, what people think of us, about our, our good name? Do we care about what Jesus thinks of our name, our reputation? Will he acknowledge that name before his father and his angels? He promised that to those who hold on to him. So, let's hold on to him. Let's pray. Father God, we're challenged by these words of Jesus. And though we are a weak and small church, in some ways we have a bit of a reputation amongst other churches and in our community of being alive. And so we pray that this might not be the case for us, that there is deadness inside. Help us to strengthen what remains. Help us to hold fast to your teaching, what we've received. And we thank and praise you and look forward to that day where you acknowledge, where your son, the Lord Jesus, acknowledges our name before you. We praise you for his name and his righteousness. Amen.